all my years as a reviewer has led to this moment. I am the oncoming storm. I am the predator. I am the one hope this universe has against him. Moffat. You gave us some of the best episodes of Sherlock when it started. And when you started to write for Doctor Who, you gave us The Empty Child, Girl in the Fireplace, and Silence in the Library. Some of my all-time favourite Doctor Who episodes. But then something happened. You wrote The Eleventh Hour. Now granted, you were working with a new Doctor, and if I have to be honest, one of my least favourites. Every writer is entitled to a bad episode or two. But then it got worse. A Time of Angels, The Pandorica Opens, Let's Kill Hitler, The Wedding of River Song. The list just went on and on. So when Smith's end finally came and Capaldi was announced as the new Doctor, I was excited. No longer a prissy boy, we were promised an old man with wit and sarcasm and snark. And none of this teen romance bullshit that we'd been dealing with Eleven and Clara. Yet now season eight has ended. And did Stephen Moffat redeem himself? Did he get finally back into the swing of things? Well, that's what we're here to find out today. We are putting him on trial. I've assembled a team of the most renowned Doctor Who reviewers, and together we will discover if Stephen Moffat has become the M. Night Shyamalan of the BBC. We will examine all season eight episodes as a whole, since Stephen Moffat is executive producer, but he only wrote seven out of the 12, so if we skip a few, you know why. At the end of this, we will ask a question. A question hidden in plain sight. Should Stephen Moffat still write for Doctor Who? While we will be jumping around a lot, I think it's only fair that we start with episode one. Smith had just transformed into Capaldi. In all the trailers and all the promo material, there was a giant dinosaur in 1980s London. And what did that have to do with the plot? Not a damn thing! The whole premise is robots harvesting body parts, and the way they tie in the dinosaur was that they needed a body part from it. You know how I said Girl in the Fireplace was a good episode? Well, if you recycle the same plot, it doesn't mean lightning will strike twice! Oh, and let's throw in a lesbian kiss for good measure! Jesus. I don't care if you're boys kissing boys, girls kissing girls, girls kissing boys, girls kissing reptiles. I don't give a damn. But at least give us a proper reason for it. The excuse they used was so paper thin it wouldn't hold water. Robots only know if you're alive if you're breathing. So if you stop, they stop. So why not treat this like swimming? Take a deep breath, hold it, run as fast as you can like a crazy person. Then take another deep breath. Hold it, and run as fast as you can like another crazy person! Looks like you need to take... a deep breath. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian, the last angry geek, and host of You Know Who. Come on, come on, stop, stop, come on. Cut it out, I mean, you guys... Thanks for having me. Well, this was our first introduction to Peter Capaldi as the 11th Doctor. Big things were expected, and so far the plot wasn't very good. However, this episode did give us some interesting points. For example, Clara, for better or worse, is now the audience surrogate. And some fans, especially the younger ones, might be upset that the Doctor is now an older man and no longer eye candy. Those people are stupid. Hey, it takes all sorts to make a fandom. There is a nice scene where Matt Smith, as the 10th Doctor, calls Clara and assures her that the new Doctor is still him. Hello? Hello? Yes, it's you. Who's this? Doctor. 
What do you mean, the doctor? I'm phoning you from Trenzalore. From before I changed. And I think you might be scared. And however scared you are, Clara, the man you are with right now, the man I hope you are with, believe me, he is more scared than anything you can imagine right now. And he... he needs you. Tara, please. Hey, for me. Help him. Go on. And don't be afraid. Yes, while I admit it was blatant fan pandering and trying to isolate the most superficial members of the audience, the scene itself I actually did like. It was really well handled. If not as subtle as a brick to the face. Also, I like that we were never sure if the robot jumped or was pushed, leaving the morality of this new doctor up in the air. Also, we are introduced to this character, no! Missy, who is in heaven? I'm Missy. You made it. I hope my boyfriend wasn't too mean to you. As the saying goes, less is more, and this made me genuinely curious who this character was. Despite me not being impressed with the plot or storyline, Capaldi's acting was fantastic, and the character of the Doctor was interesting again. Overall, this introduction was not a bad one, but it could have, perhaps, used a bit more polish. Well, you do know what they say about polish and turds, right? No? Thanks for dropping by, Brian. We'll hear back from you a little bit later with the verdict. I've seen Stephen Moffat's writing referred to as Look at me! Look how clever I am! It's all connected! While that can be good for some episodes, he tends to forget sometimes what he was doing and then just uses the just because as an explanation. The two best examples of this would be the recurring theme of the Promised Land and the creature in Listen. Let's look at Listen first. We open with the Doctor giving us a monologue of why there is not a perfect creature of hiding. Evolution perfects survival skills. There are perfect hunters. There is perfect defense. Question. Why is there no such thing as perfect hiding? I'd like to hear you say that when you're in the jungle and a jaguar chops out of nowhere. He asked what such a creature would do and turns around and on the board there is the word listen. Okay, first off, you could make the argument that that's the silence. No, you couldn't. Ah, I was wondering how long it would take for you to show up. Linkara, ladies and gentlemen, host of Atop the Fourth Wall. I have sensors on Comicron 1 that can pick up Moffat Hayden in 12 galaxies. Did you really think you could do a review this big and not have me intercept? Don't you have a history of Power Rangers you should be editing? Don't you have a job you should be doing? Touché. So I take it you'd like your two cents worth. You're damn right! The silence powers are once you turn around, they are no longer remembered. It's not really hiding, just forgetting. The creature in Listen is perfect at not being seen. But already you got me thinking about a different monster because of a poor explanation. Even if you'd referenced them, it would have made a little bit more sense. <sighs> oh well, never mind, moving on. I think everybody, at some point in their lives, has the exact same nightmare. Apparently everyone has the same dream at some point in their life of somebody grabbing them from under the bed. We do? It's a bit weird, but okay. Oh, don't pretend you don't. Next thing you'll claim is nobody else has that dream about being dressed as a banana and being slowly peeled by a gorilla with the face of your 12th grade chemistry teacher. When we go back in time, there is something under the covers of Daddy Pink's bed, but it's out of focus to us. Through some inspiring words, the Doctor stops Daddy being afraid and convinces the creature to leave. You're on the bed, I'm talking to you now. Go in peace. We won't look. 
Just go. If all you want to do is stay in, it's okay. Just leave. Look at the reflection. What is it? Imagine a thing that must never be seen. What would it do if you saw it? I don't know. Neither do I. Close your eyes. Don't look round. We head into the future, and Orson Pink is scared, as there is something outside, which should be impossible. It knocks on the door. The explanation is it was just the metal expanding. Or is it? While the doctor tries to face it, he gets knocked out and the monitors on the TARDIS start playing up. Because... Because... Don't question Moffat's genius! With the doctor knocked out, Clara flies the TARDIS. Let me repeat that. Clara flies the TARDIS. There aren't enough face palms in the world to cover this. And we arrive on Gallifrey, and the Doctor as a little kid. It turns out the creature under the bed was Clara, and she whispers the words that the Doctor said back at the beginning to Daddy. I know you're afraid. But being afraid is alright. Because didn't anybody ever tell you? Fear is a superpower. Can, can you hear that? That's the sound of Stephen Moffat's ego yelling, It's all connected! Look how clever I am! This episode is fantastic. The best of the season. Plays on the audience's fear, expecting there to be a monster, and we're in the same position as the characters, unable to see where it is or what it is doing. If it's even there at all. Are you high, or is your hat on too tight that it's stopping oxygen getting to your brain? What do you mean, if it's there at all? It's right there! Look at it! Look at it! The biggest problem I had with this episode is why? It's never explained what the creature was, why everyone has the same dream, why she doesn't want the Doctor to know they were on Gallifrey. Who wrote the word listen? How can Orson Pink exist if Danny died? Oh yeah, spoilers. At the end of this season, Danny Pink dies. No. Now, a monster does not necessarily need to be seen nor explained. If you remember the episode Midnight, where Ten was trapped on a bus and a creature essentially took over one of the passengers, we never found out what the creature wanted, what its motivation was, what its true form was like, and why it picked that particular person to take over. And that's what made it scary. But this, you are essentially saying does not exist when it's right there! Well, it was never definitively proven if it was real. <sighs> okay. Surely you don't think the subplot of The Promised Land was any good, right? The robots in London were after it. The robots in Sherwood were after it. We later find out that Missy, who is orchestrating the whole thing in heaven, is actually just in a giant hard drive. But what was the point? Why were the robots after the promised land? How did they find it? Know about it? Who put the thought into their heads? Again, Moffat starts an idea, then completely forgets about it. Okay, I will admit that it was unfulfilled potential and unanswered questions. How can you defend? Wait, what? I never said he was a perfect writer. My stance on Moffat is very complex. I love the twist about it being a Matrix data slice. I love the idea of the Cybermen and the Master using it to convert human minds into Cybermen. What I don't understand is the execution and the hints. Taking human minds throughout a certain segment of history is one thing, but taking minds from bodies that won't be awoken for hundreds of years? The bodies will have decayed to the point of uselessness, same as taking the disintegrated soldier from Into the Dalek. Mind you, it could just be that the Master didn't know the Doctor was coming at that particular moment, and it's only then that she decided to start up the plan, but considering how far into the future she was doing this, it seems like she was supposed to be waiting around there for hundreds of years. Now stop it! You're looking for excuses to defend his bad writing. Do you hate every episode this season, or are you just so bitter and dead inside you can't find joy in the little things? Big words coming from a man who burns his own comic books. Frank Miller is a hack writer who- Oh, no, 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 no. You won't distract me like that. Hey, it was worth a shot. 
Okay, to answer your question, no, I didn't hate every episode this season. In fact, there were a few which I really, really liked. Now, while each person, and us reviewers, have our own criteria, for the most part we can agree that the two best episodes of the series was Mummy on the Orient Express and Flatline. Mummy on the Orient Express sees the Doctor and Clara deciding to go on one last hurrah before they go all their separate ways, as seen in the previous episode, Kill the Moon. Jeez, that was a bad episode. On the Orient Express, a train in space, of course. A phantom mummy starts killing people. The train computer has gathered all the passengers together to try and discover what the mummy is. I loved it. I love mummies. The ghostly concept of it was a lot of fun. It was great to see the characters trapped, and I would have loved for the engineer to stay on board with the doctor, since we really haven't had any kind of blue-collar mechanic kind of character as a companion before. Flatline sees sinister beings from the second dimension seeping energy off the TARDIS and trying to cross into our world. With the Doctor stuck inside, it's up to Clara to become the Doctor, complete with her own companion. A brilliant and scary monster with some great hijinks from the Doctor himself. Clara is great as she takes on the Doctor's role as best as she can, though obviously he does things that she just can't. The episode also handles the jackass survives until the end and is still a jackass thing considerably better than Voyage of the Damned did. Hey, I will not hear a word said about anything that contains our Australian singing sensation. <laughs> Both episodes were fun, interesting, and kept us guessing how things might play out. They were also two episodes not written by Stephen Moffat, but in fact Jamie Matheson. I did not know this at the time of watching, but what makes them so good? Sure, they both have flaws, but there isn't this look how clever I am thing about it. Of course, if I'm going to be fair, Mummy on the Orient Express did trip up at the last five minutes. Clara lied to Danny and the Doctor because she wanted to keep having adventures and didn't have the balls to tell the truth. Was that Danny? What did he want? He's fine with it. Sorry. Danny, he's fine with the idea of me and you knocking about. It was his idea that we stop, but he's decided he doesn't mind and neither do I. What the hell with the last hurrah, let's keep going. And who would be responsible for this to ensure that there was conflict for future episodes? Why, that would be the head writer and executive producer. Oh, hello, Stephen Moffat. You couldn't resist leaving your mark on this episode, could you? Look, I'm not going to claim every episode was perfect. Into the Dalek was too derivative of Dalek. Kill the Moon had good atmosphere, but a ludicrous and problematic premise, but with a fantastic ending of Clara telling off the Doctor. In the Forest of Night had an interesting concept, but was ruined by utter stupidity and execution. And Death in Heaven starts out great, but falls apart by the middle as elements that are brought up are quickly forgotten, characters are unlikable or stupid, and Danny's sacrifice was completely unnecessary. Not to mention the Doctor ultimately does not do anything in the story. He literally takes no action that resolves the situation, instead just letting things happen on their own. Wow, Winkara. Maybe you aren't just a blind fanboy. You actually brought up some points which I didn't even think of. See, I feel this is the case of Yes Man Syndrome. If you keep getting told your stuff is good, and the ego keeps getting stroked, then you get into a position of power where you can surround yourself with ego strokers. When you actually do something bad, nobody will call you up on it. Back in 2008 with Russell T. Davis, he said that he would often rewrite a lot of episodes from other writers, but would never touch a word of Stephen Moffat's. This guy must have the ego the size of the Empire, and then you hand him over the reins of power. Did nobody think what might go wrong here? Yeah, thank God that never happened to me. Didn't you have a story arc with your magic gun corrupting you? Shut up! We'll be right back after this short break. Hey, you can't do that with my show! Well, I distracted him with the news that Frank Miller and Scott Snyder are teaming up to write Batman. Why, Scott Snyder? Don't make Crazy Steve part of your legacy! We'll hear back from Linkara a little bit later on with the verdict. But in the meantime, and before we get into the characters, I think we should look at the two-part season finale, that is Dark Water and Death in Heaven. And oh boy, did that split the fandom. Well, that's the understatement of the year. William Trilby from Mr. TARDIS Reviews, everyone. 
Yes, I saw that you had some rather strong views on this matter. Oh look, another understatement. But since you asked, I can't remember the last time I was so coldly furious with the TV show than I was with the two-part Series 8 finale, Dark Water and Death in Heaven, and a big part of that had to do with the whole 3W and the Don't Cremate Me thing, which I honestly hold to this day, I still stand by it, was far too inappropriate for a family show like Doctor Who. Well, I can understand it might upset some viewers, but I can also see that it might have been pushing the boundaries. Oh, and I love pushing boundaries in media, but you do that by enhancing character. You do that by developing authentic and resonant plots, not shock value. The whole thing about 3W and Death in Heaven is, is the idea of these people suffering consciousness through death. They can still feel pain even though they are corpses. They still feel the pain of being cremated. They still feel the coldness of being in a morgue. Don't cremate me. Don't cremate me. There is one simple, horrible possibility that has never occurred to anyone throughout human history. Don't say it. The dead remain conscious. And that could potentially traumatise some children or younger viewers or someone who have lost a relative recently. And there are so many people saying that it was a scam in, like made by Missy and things like that. But you honestly need to watch the episodes again because Death in Heaven pretty much proves that the whole don't cremate me consciousness after death thing was not a scam. But was an actual established thing that happens in this Doctor Who universe. That in the universe of Doctor Who, these characters do go to an afterlife and do feel pain. Funny enough, this was the one point I didn't have a problem with. Please tell me you're joking. For me, when I watch something, I ask two questions. Did it entertain me, and did it make me think? It is an interesting concept, and explored a subject we often wonder about. It was complete bollocks, of course. But if you can accept the fact that a man flies around in a little blue box around the universe, surely you could entertain this idea. The Doctor himself shows it's complete crap, but it made us think for a moment, so it did its job. Fakery. All of it. It's a con, it's a racket. But it could potentially mess up a younger viewer whose relatives have died recently. Yes, it could. Which is why it's the parents' responsibility to explain that this is all fake. The same way that statues can't move and take you back in time, and the dark won't kill you. Yes, I know you have to be able to differentiate between fiction and fact and things like that, but the thing about Doctor Who is that it has a very close relation to its audience in terms of the universe it has established. For example, at the BBC proms, the Daleks show up to take over the concert hall. Davros shows up in character to take over the concert hall. You had that message um, very shortly before or after Death in Heaven was broadcast, where Peter Capaldi sent a message to a young child with autism whose grandmother had passed away. Um, so he said in character that everything was going to be okay. He was in character, he referenced Clara. When you have such a close-knit relationship with the fan base, your younger viewers, to try and make them feel the authenticity of this universe, and then you drop a bombshell like, oh, by the way, your relatives could have suffered horribly after they died, that's a step too far. That's something that not even Torchwood probably would have done, and that was an adult show, let alone a family show. Sorry, Trilby. I think we're going to have to agree to disagree on this one. Besides, there is so much more to complain about in this episode than just that. The Master returns in the form of Missy, and while it can be seen as slightly stupid, I could forgive that. The Master in the old serial would just appear with no rhyme or reason. If we go back a few seasons to Ten's run... Ah, oh, yes! That's how he hid himself from me, because I should have sent to another time order and I should have known way back then. Why didn't he know? How was Missy able to watch the Doctor? How was the machine able to take the soldier Gretchen when it was off Earth and in the future? How could she kill two guards like that without them making a move? Well, Stephen Moffat's just because reasoning, I suppose, which has been prevalent in a lot of his scripts. I also don't like the treatment of the Cybermen. In recent stories in general, but it's definitely felt in Death in Heaven, how you have all of these Cybermen wandering around a graveyard who are ready to destroy the world. There's, there's hundreds of them surrounding Clara, the Doctor, and Danny. 
and there's no sense of danger. They're just set dressing, they're wandering around in the background. There's one side man who's just leaning on a grave, just chilling all max and relaxing all cool. It's sort of like Asylum of the Daleks where they were there to be put on the poster in the promotional material to have all of this hype saying the Daleks are going to be in the story. But in Asylum of the Daleks, they were just set dressing. They were shooting at and shouting at Rory Williams, but he could power slide under a door and there was no tension whatsoever. And the rain. It rains and people become Cybermen. How the hell does that work? And also the fact that the Brigadier was a Cyberman. I, I don't like that idea. The Brigadier has been an, a near constant in the Doctor Who universe, has saved the world so many times through conflict and violence, and he finally had a peaceful death. He died in his bed with, um, with um, an extra brandy next to him, waiting for the Doctor to arrive. He died peacefully. Doctor, I'm so sorry. We didn't know how to contact you. I'm afraid Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart passed away a few months ago. Doctor? Yeah, yeah. Uh... Yes, yes. Uh, he was very peaceful. Talked a lot about you, if that's any comfort. Always made us pour an extra brandy. And now he's brought back as a Cyberman, a weapon of war. That's a bit too far for me. And also the fact that if the Brigadier turned into a Cyberman, as well as all of the graves and things like that throughout human history, because um, Missy was getting people from the past, present and the future, as established from the Half-Face Man and Gretchen, um, past, present and future, Potentially all of the Doctor's companions who have been buried on Earth were also Cybermen as well. Sarah Jane, uh, Tegan, Adric, if, um, if, they went to, if Missy went to the dinosaur, the, the, the Jurassic period when he died, and so many others. I don't like that. I don't like the idea of all of the Doctor's companions throughout time and space becoming Cybermen. Yeah, as you can guess, I had a few issues with the main season finale, as did Mr. Tardis. Damn right. So what about the good stuff? Hey, there was good stuff. Well, she from... From... Do you do anything anymore? Just because I don't post videos online and don't have a body, it doesn't mean I don't do anything. Like? Primarily, I just haunt film brain. Oh. There were good things about the episode, the Clara and Doctor scene in the volcano, that was an amazingly performed scene between the two of them. One last chance. And I don't care about the rules, I don't give a damn about paradoxes. Save Danny, bring him back, or I swear, you will never step inside your daughters again. No. Do as you were told. No. Say it again so I know you mean it. No. I'm not kidding, Doctor. Right, right. I, will, I will do it! Out of my car, I don't think you will! You can tell she's still grieving. She's not thinking rationally during that entire sequence. And the look on her face when she throws away that final key, it's a realization. She's gone too far. She knows it. But she still doesn't care. That is. That's beautiful. Do it again. Why are you just standing there to you understand what I have just done? Yes, okay. That was pretty cool. And what about one of my new favourite characters? Zed. He was awesome. That's life. Well, not life, I suppose, but... Okay, you're dead, um, and this is what's next. You have iPads in the afterlife. iPads. We have Steve Jobs. <laughs> Oh, a mission to Damn right, there should be a spin-off just with Seb. Admin in the afterlife. There's the title. BBC, call me. <laughs> I watched the hell out of that. Pity Missy killed him. And what about everyone's favourite fangirl, Osgood? Oh, bless her. Selfies are never as good, are they? And you're having a lovely moment. Hang on. Uh, no, nice bow tie. Bow ties are cool. You mean the same Osgood who was disintegrated? That Osgood, you mean? No. Missy, the master, whatever you call yourself, I promise I'm much more useful to you alive. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's definitely true. That is a good point well made. I'm proud of you, sister. But did I mention the murder? Oh. See, the fans of Doctor Who, they moan and moan and moan that the people in it never die, and then as soon as someone dies, they moan and moan and moan about the person who was killed. Fuck you all. 
And what about the moment with the Brigadier when he salutes him at the end? How can you find fault with that? It was moving, it was touching. It Cheap, emotionally manipulative. Can't find any problems with that. Fine. You were one of those cynical assholes, aren't you? Oh, the ones who were never sought in happy. How about the ending then? Danny doesn't come back from the dead. The Doctor and Clara both lie to each other. They both part. Sad ending. Happy? Yeah. That was pretty good, wasn't it? See? Till they put bloody Santa Claus at the end! Uh, there you are. I knew I'd get round to you eventually. Now, stop gawping and tell me. What do you want for Christmas? Yeah, I didn't mind that. Nick Frost is a good Santa Claus. Do you know what I love about Stephen Moffat haters the most, though? They seem to be under the impression that they can do it better. Under Stephen Moffat, uh, under um, Stephen Moffat, not Russell T. Davis, not David Tennant, under Stephen Moffat and Matt Smith, let me remind you, the show went global. It didn't break out in the UK, it actually diminished in the UK, to be fair, but globally it's gone huge. And that's under Stephen Moffat's rule. Stephen Moffat's storylines. So for all the people online who want to moan, 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 and at the end of the day, you've got a loud voice, but you're a minority. The BBC doesn't care about that. They care about making money. They are a corporation. Corporations want to make money. And when you've got a man who has taken the show and turned it into a global success, they'd be stupid to get rid of him. It's like in the WWE with Cena. You know, Moffat haters, Cena haters, they're all the same sort of thing. They want to turn Cena heel. Cena makes the WWE a business shit loads of money. Oh, who in their right mind would say, okay, our biggest money maker, let's turn him heel, stop all that money coming in, and have no real plan about where we're going to make our money now. You know, if you had a company and you had a really popular character in that company, you know, he was like your flagship character, the one who made you all the money, the one who was most recognizable, who in their right mind would then kill that character off? Or remove him, or turn him heel, or just stop him altogether, or kick him from the company? When the company, when the show, when whatever it is, is not only the flagship, it's the most popular thing the company has. What business person in their right mind would think that's a good idea? You people on the internet, You've got a loud voice, but you're in a minority. And that just kills you, doesn't it? <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Thank you, Welshie, for that insightful rant there. We'll hear back from both Mr. Tardis and Welshie a little bit later on with the verdict. Now, I am not one of these people who say, the Doctor doesn't, insert home thing here. Each Doctor is different and unique, and hopefully learns from the past incarnation. But if the Doctor is a dick, don't try to make him cute. I think that sums up Matt Smith's run. He was a complete asshole, but Moffat and the other eyes kept trying to make him like he was a big kid and it wasn't really his fault. That's not the Doctor out of character. That's the bad writing of a character, period. There's a lot of support from the Doctor Who cast, but let's focus on the main ones. Clara. Fuck. Danny. Fuck. Missy. Yeah. And the Doctor. What? Is anyone else hearing that? The Doctor is amazing, as you may have picked up on my subtle hints. I was not a fan of Matt Smith's incarnation, but Capaldi as the Doctor would carry even the worst episodes. The fun of the Doctor comes because he's not young and attractive, so he doesn't need to be chasing after the hot characters, nor have them chasing after him. He is old, he is grizzled, he is sarcastic, and he is a bit of an asshole. And that is fantastic. He doesn't hold people's hand, and he doesn't give two shits what you think about him. He has the ego the size of the TARDIS, and he single-handedly saved this series, in my opinion. Still a bit of a twat. Who keeps saying that? Me. Diamanda Hagen, mistress of Afghanistan and creature of the twatty who reviews in the quick guide to classic Who. An oasis of tense Doctor hatred and a sea of stupid people. Yes, Diamanda, I know who you are. You've killed me at least twice in the review of us. The question I'm asking is why I, and more importantly our viewers, 
can't see you on screen. Cause I only do voiceover when doing Doctor Who stuff, and I have opinions that must be expressed. Oh. And since this is a cameo, they might not even be mine that I'm expressing. Wait, what? In fact, I'm from an alternate reality where Sue Perkins was the Tenth Doctor, and I understand the squee. What the fuck is a squee? So, <clears throat> allow me to tell you why your Doctor Who is shit. While the general character of Twelve is much better than your version of Ten or Eleven, and he's much more like the base personality of the Doctor, i.e. he's more like One, there are some choices that seemed completely out of fucking left field. For example, why does the Doctor all of a sudden hate soldiers? He essentially founded Unit, he was best friends with the Brigadier, Rory for all intents and purposes was a soldier, and thanks to the 50th anniversary special, he was a soldier. It appears the only motivation for this sudden change is so he and Danny can have some conflict. However, it is so forced and unbelievable, it really shows the crack in the wall. See, see what I did there? I made a Doctor Who reference. Remind me to kill you again when the review is over, you cybernetic music jockey! Okay, so what do you think about Clara and Danny? You mean paint drying and grass growing? I think they are really interesting and fleshed out characters. <laughs> what do you think I think about them? Danny is a 2D pencil drawing, a soldier suffering from slight PTSD just because he killed a child? Oh my god! I'm supposed to feel bad for doing that? Oh no! I must be a terrible person! And he's got the charm of dripping water! He is there basically to be the good guy and give Clara a love interest since she can no longer go after the doctor. I didn't mind Danny so much, but his perfect boyfriend shtick got old really fast. When we came to the episode The Forest of the Night, Danny was just too perfect. He was a good leader, understanding, and dull as batshit. I totally called it that the next episode he would die. And he did. When you layer on that much, look how happy he makes me. That's writer's code for, now watch us kill him off. As for Clara, it's only in this episode she actually started doing something. But even then, she runs around like a lovesick puppy for Danny and a dog chasing after a car with the doctor. She doesn't do anything. She is the MacGuffin of the series She spends most of her time telling the doctor off or asking questions on behalf of the audience. I did like how they were at least trying with Clara, but in the end, she still falls flat because of the bad writing. The end of Kill the Moon. While it was a very bad episode, the end part was brilliant. Clara having it out with the Doctor gave us some real character development. She was a person instead of a MacGuffin. She left the Doctor and wanted out because of the way he treated her. In contrast, the next episode of Mummy on the Orient Express, which was a brilliant episode, was ruined in the last five minutes, with the teen romance high school bullcrap of her lying to her boyfriend and the Doctor so she can still keep having adventures. And when she is found out, there are no consequences. Danny just says, oh, okay. And the doctor doesn't care at all. What kind of crap is that? And our final character of Missy, who actually turns out to be the master. I actually didn't have any strong opinions one way or another about her. Me neither. Yes, it was good that we got a female master as it potentially opens the door for a female doctor. But the character herself was not bad. Just not amazing. She was just there. Hamming it up. In Dark Water, she was alienating it up. In Death in Heaven, she was simming it up. I will give Muffet points that she obviously was having fun and having a blast while going absolutely bonkers. But to introduce her, then kill her off so quickly, it seems like a waste. Why write a character and then give her nothing to do? Because Muffet is a sexual deviant. His particular fetish is killing off characters people like so he can get off. That and witty angry woman who can break nerds in half with her thighs. Don't tell me you haven't noticed. That would explain so much. Anyway, we're getting close to the verdict, so we'll hear back from you a little bit later, dear Manda. Why don't you go kill some minions or something? Don't tell me what to do. I will go and kill some minions, but not because you told me to. I'll go and do it because it makes me happy. In a second, Jill. Now, as I was saying... Um, yeah, this is kind of important. I'll introduce you in a second, Jill. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, to help give our closing arguments, I present Jill Bearup from Stuff You Like, who is going to be giving us an in-depth analysis of... Give it! What?! I haven't seen season eight yet. What do you mean you haven't seen season eight? 
You're doing the closing arguments! You know how it is. I mean, I got accepted onto Channel Awesome, and then my husband and I moved to Germany, and then my cat went missing, and I was taking this German course. Uh, you know how it is. I got really busy. I thought, no, I'll just wait for the DVDs. Well, that bloody doesn't help us now, does it? Well, yeah, but I can at least comment on the man. I mean, I've only seen two episodes of Peter Capaldi's Doctor so far, but, you know, I, I've kind of liked them both. That said, even a double quarter pounder with cheese looks good before you try eating it. But Stephen Moffat I can talk about really well. Okay, here are the things that Stephen Moffat is really good at. First of all, giving you nightmares. If you don't want to sleep for a couple of weeks, you need to call him and he will whip you up some weeping angels or some gas mask zombies or whatever. I must be the only guy who doesn't think they're scary. Creative, sure, but scary, nah. Oh, hush you. I guess the second thing is he's also really good at creating badass women who can handle a gun and kick butt and take names and crack wise while they're doing it. So, what kind of doctor are you? Archaeology. And that would be the third thing, I guess. He's really good at cracking wise. You know, he is eminently quotable. I have no sword. I don't need a sword. Because I am the doctor. And this is my spoon. And his monologues tend to be West Wing quality, just with more spaceships. Hello, Stonehenge! Who takes the Pandorica takes the universe. But bad news, everyone! Cause guess who? Ha! They sent you lot, you're all whizzing about. It's really very distracting. Could you all just stay still a minute? Because I am talking! Now, the question of the hour is, who's got Pandorica? Answer, I do. Next question, who's coming to take it from me? Come on! Look at me. No plan, no backup, no weapons worth a damn. Oh, and something else I don't have. Anything to lose. So... If you're sitting up there in your silly little spaceship with all your silly little guns and you've got any plans on taking the Pandorica tonight, just remember who's standing in your way. Remember every black day I ever stopped you. And then, and then, do the smart thing. Let somebody else try first. Okay, I will concede that. To a point! He is very good at creating one type of woman, like River Song. And then he just copies and pastes her over, and over, and over again. Well, yeah, there is that. And also the fact that most of them seem to fall in love with the Doctor, and often don't really have anything more to their personalities than that. 2D characters are bad, but I could at least forgive them if they were passable. But what we got in season six was downright horrible. Um, were we not just talking about season eight? Oh no, you opened up the door for past seasons, so let's examine it, shall we? The River and Doctor's relationship is abusive, as in Twilight Fifty Shades of Grey abusive. The way he treated her and the way she just took it and accepted it, because I love him, and excusing his bad behaviour with the doctor lies, is the exact kind of thing a battered woman would say. Travel with me then. Whenever and wherever you want. But not all the time. One psychopath per TARDIS, don't you think? Uh. Yeah, the word that describes how uncomfortable that makes me is very. Did Moffat do a massive arc for this series? And, uh, did it fall apart if you thought about it for more than a minute? You say arc, I say massive convoluted piece of poorly executed crap. So that'd be a yes. I mean, I know Stephen Moffat loves to do these huge arcs, but every now and again, you gotta take a step back. Step back? He needs to take a rocket and see it from space. Look, it's only fair that we point out not everything was Stephen Moffat's fault. In the series, he did not write The Forest of the Night, 
where we have some of the most annoying child characters, an explanation that people who suffer from mental illness really do see things, and the whole concept is a blatant rip-off of Karen Harrelian's picture. No. That credit goes to Frank Cortell Boyce. Moffat is also free from sin from the universally renowned worst episode of the season, Kill the Moon, which gave us a giant space dragon and stupid spider organism. That one goes to Peter Harness. That said, a machine is only as good as its parts, and with the machine wobbling as it is, it doesn't bow well for Mr. Moffat. Are you done mocking him yet? Not by a long shot, but stick around, we're about to finish up. So this is it. Members of the jury, you have heard the evidence, you have given your own testimonials. Now, how do you find the defendant? I have managed to make an entire series with how bad the writing and you who is with the twenty who reviews. Gil fucking T. And since this isn't a twenty who review, you can't tell if this is my real opinion or not. Hey, I think Steven's done a great job. My biggest complaint is that he's guilty of ignoring continuity at times, but he does manage to involve his audience by forging strong emotional connections. NOT GUILTY! Stephen Moffat genuinely used to be my favourite writer, which is why it pains me to say that he has definitely fallen from grace. I think there needs to be some fresh blood, a new showrunner, and maybe Stephen Moffat can return for a script a year like he used to, and hopefully the quality will return. I say guilty. Yeah, I mentioned my thoughts on Moffat are complex, but I don't think he deserves all the hate he gets. Not guilty. Stephen Moffat has given us one of the best series of Doctor Who. New Who especially, season 5 is still my favourite. There's still more to come. He's obviously got a plan, he knows what he's doing. I say let him continue. Not guilty. He's a good writer, but I don't think he should be in charge anymore. Guilty. Wow, hung jury. Maybe we should do some more reflecting. Or maybe I could just give my vote. He's gonna burn. Guilty. And I can already hear you trolls in the comments. Oh, you didn't do a fair trial. Surely these people do not reflect how everyone feels about Stephen Moffat. To that I say... Guilty. 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 Pleasures. Wait, no. Guilty. 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 Oh, so guilty. You know what? Fuck you all. Stephen Moffat, you have brought confusion and stupidity to a show about a man who flies around in a police box through time and space. Therefore, it is the ruling that we find you- Wait! Nash from Radio Dead Air? I thought you weren't available to cameo. In fact, I thought you said you were on a plane to England. No, I just said that because I didn't want to bash Stephen Moffat even though he deserves it. Quiet, you! Can you get on with it? I was about to wrap things up here. Well, you can't. I have an emergency injunction demanding an immediate halt to this review right now. On what grounds? On the grounds you didn't include the Christmas special. To review this without giving every episode a fair go would be a great miscarriage of justice. Since when could you file an injunction? Since David made me a lawyer for the Muppet Wish Day review. You know, you're just putting off the inevitable. I'll take what I can get. Well, guys, it looks like I have to postpone judgment until I get to review the Christmas episode. Hey, do you guys want to hang around so we can review it together? Hell no! You know, I still have to actually go and watch the series. Thanks, Nash. It's what I do. Well, I can't pass judgment until I've officially watched the Christmas episode, apparently. But, in the meantime, why don't you guys leave a comment below of what your favourite and least favourite Stephen Moffat episode is. And please, don't everyone say Blink. Yes, we know it was good, but that was like one of his first ones. Let's be a little bit more original than that, shall we? Now, if you'll excuse me... I gotta go get my Christmas on.
going to be a Christmas special. Santa will also visit your house. Why, hello there! I am Santa Claus! Ho, ho, ho! I've been checking my list, and, uh, little Stevie Moffat, you are neither naughty nor nice. You are guilty. Um, it was Mark Gatiss' idea, and it's, it was very much his pitch. Uh, he did... <laughs>